Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is a real treat. So many of those shows we just saw on the screen have touched us personally in, in various ways. Uh, and the screening last night, I've been doing this a very long time. And I think the only other time I saw this auditorium opened up at the top two was for Matt Groening's uh, screening of The Simpsons. And that's your show. <laughs> so um, for years as head of the studio, how have you seen, I like, starting with a, you know, a broad overview of what you do. How have you seen the American market uh, evolve? 25 words or less, <laughs> that's a broad question. Oh, wow, 25 words or no, less. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, it is radically evolving. It seems like it's changing every day. It's so competitive. When Gary and I first started running the studio 16 years ago, we were primarily selling to the four broadcast networks. And now, you know, 16 years later, we have 38 shows across 13 different platforms. So the number of buyers has increased dramatically. The output of content from our company has changed dramatically. You know, it's gotten harder in many ways. The bar is very high. It used to be that you could have a show that was sort of a mid-range performer and it could still be a very good piece of business and that's no longer the case. This is a hit driven business, as you saw from our reel, right. those are the shows that will migrate into our library. Those will be assets for our company for decades to come. It's no longer good enough to have a sort of mid-range hit. And the competitiveness, I think, is what's changed most dramatically. That sounds like quite a challenge. Um, so you see many opportunities for the product that you can give right across a variety of uh, cable and broadcast and digital. Um, I imagine, since we're in Cannes, um, that the international market has been important to you and, and to what you've been able to get onto the screen and that you've worked with Mark Kaner and Marion Edwards closely. Tell me a little bit of how that um, how that relationship has worked and what International has brought to what you've been able to do. We've been working with Mark and Marion for, uh, boy, probably about 15 years, maybe even a little longer. And, um, you know, we learned very early on. I actually started coming uh, to this market in the mid 90s and learned very quickly that we had a pretty insular view of the TV business uh, back in Los Angeles. And we began uh, taking into account. Um, what clients were telling us here about what worked in their market to um, impact our development. You know, we're still programming to the U.S. market, and I think we have to concern ourselves with that. But around the edges, we might hear an idea that just has no international appeal, and that's going to impact uh, our, our decision at home. Um, the one thing that um, I learned very early is that um, the great shows, they work all over the world. It's, it's, it's the exception is one or two markets where something doesn't work. You know, the, the Ally McBeals, the 24s, the prison breaks, they just work all over. Um, and, and so you actually learn quite a bit about your shows during the screenings when literally thousands of great television executives come through Los Angeles, see our shows, and in the course of having lunches and meetings, you get a lot of feedback that can be pretty helpful. Because you need to produce not only high quality, which you do, but you need a hit, how has that changed the amount of risk you can afford to take? And what have you learned from some of the riskiest shows that you've pursued? Well, it's actually risk has been the thing that we've embraced most, I think, at our company. We learned a long time ago that you know, playing it safe is not a winning strategy. It's not going to end us with a library of content that stands out you know, we have had for several years now a very lucrative, successful output deal with Netflix. It's many of the shows of ours from the past and some current series seasons of shows, but the way that our content stands out that a company like Netflix would look to build their platform on the back of content that is produced by a company, it has to be loud, it has to be bold, it has to be distinctive. And Gary and I always say that when we're in a pitch, especially with a creator like Chris Carter, and I was so proud of, of the X-Files last night, I just think the new season is extraordinary and, and picks up right where we left off. But Chris Carter, Seth MacFarlane, Ryan Murphy, Howard Gordon, and Alex Gonza, typically when they come in to pitch us, 
they'll pitch something that makes you feel mildly stressed out, where you think <laughs> this could be a disastrous idea or it could be a big hit. And you have to embrace that feeling. You have to just put aside any anxieties and any desire to stay in the middle and push content as far as possible in an organic way. But those have been our greatest successes, as Gary just said, X-Files, 24, Ally McBeal, Glee, on and on, we have been rewarded in the greatest way for being risk takers. I would think that running the studio would give you, fill quite a few hours of your day. What led you to want to take on the network as well? I'm so happy that's yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really happened uh, pretty organically. We had been successful for a long time at the studio running an independent studio model. Um, clearly, delivering a show to the Fox network was always the most important thing we could do, but we were rewarded just as much for delivering uh, successful shows to other platforms. And we had grown, uh, we had grown a cable business, uh, which, you know, was a market leader. And, uh, but what we were discovering with the change in the business that Dana alluded to at the top with so many more networks and channels and platforms, and everyone was coming to the same conclusion. They wanted to own their own content. And so we were beginning to find it. Um, from the studio perspective, a little bit more challenging to sell projects around town. And from the network perspective, they were clearly having a problem where other suppliers weren't coming to them with their best uh, projects. And we just felt for the health of our company, uh, this was something that had to happen and create a more streamlined um, uh, road from what the studio does, which is get in business with great uh, creators and come up with these great ideas, uh, kind of a more streamlined development road to the network so uh, the Fox network could be sure to have um, a steady supply of great programming. But you're still open, both at the studio and the network, to embrace voices from outside the larger family, right? Uh, yeah, that's very much true. Our objective when we took this job and went into a parent company over the studio and the network was to keep both companies individual. We were not and independent. We were not interested in corrupting either of the cultures and doing some sort of merger. We call them aligned companies. The companies have not been merged. The studio resides in one building on the Fox lot and the network in another, and Gary and I actually travel back and forth so that producers who have exclusive deals with 20th Century Fox Television, though are not doing shows for FBC, can feel like they're in an environment where they're not walking down halls past our network's executives. And similarly, when Peter Roth and the Warner Brothers team comes in to pitch the network, they're not encountering our studio executives all the time. It just keeps those cultures fe feeling independent. And again, it's been a great alignment and all of our executives recognize the great benefit in creating a hit from 20th Century Fox Television that travels, you know, the transportation is the Fox Broadcasting Company. They see it in the way we market their shows, and they see it in the ultimate value of that content migrating back to our library. Right. Um, we mentioned before the international market. I'm sure there are buyers here who, um, whether from you or from others, have bought a show, fallen in love with it, and then unfortunately it had to be canceled earlier than had been hoped. Give them a That's little... Dana's fault. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, give them a little bit idea, because it's not just a very quick, arbitrary decision. There are many factors that go into why you have to let go of a show. Gary rolls dice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's actually it's an interesting time, because with on-demand viewing, um, the decisions aren't quite as easy as they used to be. Uh, you can have a live same-day number that makes you feel uh, pretty nauseous the next morning, only to discover uh, three days later or seven days later or even 30 days later that a lot of people ended up coming to watch that show. And I think you have to give uh, an opportunity. If you believe in the show, you have to give it an opportunity to connect with the audience. Um, you know, I, I think that on-demand viewing I think initially is maybe evidence that show wasn't their top priority. They watched something else that night and they delayed it. But over time, they fall in love with the series and that priority begins to change. And, and the truth is, 
ultimately, if people are watching within a measured time period, three days, uh, typically, or even seven days, we're monetizing it with our advertisers. And, um, and so uh, I won't say that we are completely agnostic as to when someone watches this, clearly watching live same day is, is the best financial model because as people delay, some of the platforms don't have advertising or allow fast forwarding. But many of the uh, platforms, Hulu, uh, for example, uh, the MVPDs, VOD systems, um, our own Fox Now, they all have fast forwarding disabled. So people who watch in, in the next three to seven days are just as valuable. So I think, you know, people, you read in the press, you see people you know, think that networks have uh, quick trigger fingers to kill shows. I actually think the opposite is true, and you're going to see greater patience as we allow um, viewership to aggregate. Give us a sense of, you mentioned those phenomenal showrunners who come to you. Um, how do you work with them to allow them to follow their vision and yet come with a show that would fit you know, whatever platform it is that you want that show to air on? Sure. Well, you know, we've had the most extraordinary relationships over the past 16 years with the greatest creators. So, you know, first and for foremost, at the studio, we're a home to great creators. That's what we've built our company on. That is, that's the bread and butter of our business. We are really nothing without our creative partners. So, you know, we try to establish an environment where they're free to think their biggest thoughts where they can come in and they can have honest conversations with us about their ideas, about you know, just the germ of an idea and we'll help them shape what ultimately becomes their show. Or they come in with something that's fully baked and we spend time with them trying to decide what the right network is, you know, what's the right form of transportation for their show, but a, a show's come in you know, ready to pitch to network. So there's not really one size fits all in terms of development. We're very honest with our creators. You know, if someone were to come in and we've spent so much time with Mark Kaner and Marian Edwards and Gina Brogi who are here, you know, our international partners at, at the company, talking about what shows travel best, you know, his, historically what's worked in the international marketplace and we educate our writers. That doesn't mean we force them mm. to do any genre or right. to pursue any idea. And now that there are so many platforms hungry, hungry for content, it's a little bit easier. You know, you can sort of find the right home for virtually any idea now, but we are honest with them and we talk to them about monetizing their art and which are the most successful paths to doing that and which paths will be filled with obstacles. So it's really about relationships, trusting each other, you know, our partners being prepared to hear the truth and then be able to say to us that they still have passion for an idea, something they want to put themselves into. I think when you look at Modern Family or Glee or How I Met Your Mother and you see so much of those creators lives and themselves and those characters and it typically results in a pretty special experience right. for a viewer. I have to say I was speaking to Tim Kring just yesterday and when I mentioned I would be moderating this panel, I'm not kidding, he said Dana gives the best notes ever. <laughs> I'm going to have to have him say that into a tape recorder okay. <laughs> so I can replay it for other creators. <laughs> can we talk about the empire phenomenon for a moment? So I, for my work, I'm very lucky. I get to watch a lot of TV. When I sampled it, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. And I was positively blown away. Yes, it's a family drama. Yes, it's hip hop. Yeah. But the layers of, of understanding worlds that I wasn't exposed to. It was just amazing. How did that come to be? Well, um, <laughs> we were very fortunate. We had a producer who's worked with us for a long time, Brian Grazer, who um, had a real interest in trying to explore the hip hop world. And he's represented over at CAA. And Lee Daniels, who of course um, directed The Butler and Precious, um, had come up with this idea that he and Danny Strong, who wrote uh, The Butler uh, right. with him, um, had to do a, um, a as they put it, uh, dynasty set in a hip hop world. And we put Brian together uh, with them and they hatched this idea in this world. And, you know, no one knows what's going to work and what's not. 
um, upfront, and people who tell you they do are, are kind of full of it. However, they came in and pitched just the most um, specific characters in what felt like an incredibly authentic world. And while it was heightened, at its core, it was very grounded in authenticity. And um, the characters were so personal to Lee, in particular, that um, it just was one of those magical pitches where you know you could you could play the show in your mind because they were being so specific, and um, and then kind of everything went right. Really, starting with uh, Danny and Lee writing a great script. You know, the casting was magical, uh, both uh, Taraji and Terrence in particular. But we discovered. Uh, people like Jesse and Yaz, um, who really neither had done uh, much acting. And, uh, and um, Lee did a great job with the pilot, and you know, it, it sort of became you know, what it became. And um, while we didn't know really for sure what we had, uh, along with um, Kevin Riley, who was running the network, uh, when we made that pilot, we all decided rather than rushing it to air for the fall, we would take our time with it. It's a hard show to produce. That music is time consuming uh, to, to create. Um, so we decided to hold it to mid-season, and then Dane and I came in to the network, and for that we had great timing, and put together um, you know, a really big um, and uh, I think great marketing campaign. We have a great marketing team at the network, uh, led by Joe Early, and I think they really got what that show was about. And just everything came together, and, and you can never quite predict that level of success, but I will say it was uh, an incredibly energizing and The numbers were, the were incredible, weren't they, for broadcast TV? They were amazing. Sort of extraordinary, and then extraordinary throughout the multi-platform roll-up where you see, you know, 26 million to 30 million people watching one show. Right. And as recently as just before the show premiered, people were catching up on Hulu, on Fox Now, on the various catch-up platforms, and they were watching, you know, sort of 400,000 people a week were watching the show, so pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, my teenage daughter does not know what to do with me as I go around the house humming, you're so beautiful, but <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what are you? Show, anyway. us, show us what it's like. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> don't, 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 don't say that twice. You touched on marketing. Um, you have great shows. It's a very crowded environment. How do you make sure, maybe that's not the right term, but you want as many people as possible to sample it, at least the first time. How do you get around that challenge? Well, you know, as Gary said, we have a fantastic marketing team. It's a lot of executives who have worked at the network for a very long time. They're very familiar with the Fox DNA. And they're great showmen, and they pick images and messages that resonate with viewers. You know, this, I think, 130, 135 scripted shows are slated for this fall. It's crazy. 400 throughout the year, up from five years ago where it was about 115. There are so many messages. There are so many people trying to get your attention. The marketing has to be clear, it has to resonate, it has to be bold, it has to say, sample me, try me. And I think that's a lot of what you saw in Empire, and frankly, each of our shows, I think Scream Queen was mar Queens was marketed in an incredible way, you know, going into this year. We had the benefit of having a series order last year, so we spent some time last year getting people aware of the title. But I think at the point we launched, it was the title that had the fourth greatest awareness and was the only title in the group that included the Muppets and mm. Minority Report that was not a pre-sold title. But on Empire, you know, the first images that they came to Gary and me with were pictures of the family with rap chains. And it felt, you know, it was definitely a way to go with the show. You definitely could see it you could see that billboard, and we really challenged them to go back and focus on this prestigious group of talent that's come together where you have Oscar-nominated director, writer, our two stars are not Oscar-nominated, this phenomenal group of talent. Bring me back the key art that says that. And right. it was just that beautiful artwork with Terrence and Taraji, Terrence from the back of the profile, and you see Taraji's face. And it just was so compelling, and that is what is required at every level of the campaign, is that kind of scrutiny and that process, which is 
makes it the most um, sparkly, attention-getting, and yet high prestige message. And after that, how much does word of mouth help? Help Because didn't Empire and many other shows of yours benefit from that as well? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think it was an example of the broadcast model uh, really working for us. Um, the fact that we didn't, um, like the digital platforms, we didn't put out all 12 episodes at once. We put them out uh, once a week and word began to spread and people wanted to be part of the, the national conversation uh, about the show. And, uh, you know, you could see it. You could see the digital platforms starting, uh, you know, Wednesday night late in the middle of the night. You could just see the crazy viewership as uh, people wanted to catch up who hadn't seen it or people wanted to watch it again. And uh, you could see the social conversation online also spike along with it. And, uh, you know, by the end of the first season, episode, uh, episode 12, uh, we, we had essentially historic uh, ratings in that that show went up week after week after week for 12 straight weeks and uh, and I think the 12th episode hit over 30 days 30 million people Amazing. it was sensational Amazing. so last night we saw um, the X-Files and you which is a show that that came back um, 24 came back prison break I think there's work on coming back how do you determine what factors what magic alchemy has to occur for you to decide to bring something back well you know the great news about these SVOD platforms that we're in business with that have our library is that there's a whole new audience of people who have been introduced to shows like the ones you just mentioned who have been able to catch up who are familiar now that has built an appetite for original news stories to be told. And I guess I would say how we make our determination about which ones we're gonna go forward with is if the creators have great stories to tell still. As you saw last night, those characters, you know, when they're reunited on film, it's such a gratifying moment. I mean, anyone that was a fan of the X-Files would have an aha, that's what I've been waiting for. I'm, I'm hungry for more stories about these beloved characters. So if they have great stories to tell and it feels like the story is not, is not fully told, we're, gonna, you know, we're definitely going to move forward with those projects. Right. And the first one we brought back actually was Family Guy, and we've told the story many times, but uh, we kept Seth MacFarlane under a deal even after Family Guy was canceled. And he would stop by my office, I would say, once every two weeks to ask me, <laughs> can we get back into production? Can we get back into production? It was almost as much to make him stop as anything <laughs> else to uh, bring that series back. Um, uh, the X-Files is going to be um, six episodes, sort of an event. Um, broadcast needs events? I mean, are, are, are these a good way to showcase a show and to draw uh, attention to your network? Yes, absolutely. You know, you have to, you have to be showman. You know, this is the broadcast business. You're speaking to a huge number of people. You have to eventize your schedule. I actually think Empire created an event. It was, you know, the only sh new show premiering in, you know, that short period of time last year, the first week of January. We moved American Idol up so that there could be some noise around it. And it felt the marketing campaign drove urgency to watching something that's felt special and that wasn't on the air. And we definitely look at these event miniseries. You look how Wayward Pines with M. Night Shyamalan and just a phenomenal cast going into summer was the number one scripted show on television last summer. And again, it just feels like you have to put together a schedule that has a lot of reasons throughout the year for many different people to come back to a broadcast. And then within the X-Files, we'll have a great opportunity to promote our new shows for mid-season. So it's a little bit the strategy of broadcast, which is create an event right. and then feed the rest of your schedule. And as many times as we can do that, we are going to. And as many times as we can do stuff that celebrates the great history of this network. So it all comes together. It tells a story about the company. It brings a lot of viewers to our network and then gives us the opportunity to launch new shows. Now, you also produce for cable, which is a little bit of a different model. And if I may uh, personally vent about something, I think it's horrible that the Americans not didn't get any 
uh, Emmy nominations. That is such a tremendous show. So if anybody from the Emmy, yes, yes, let's hear it, let's hear it. It's a phenomenal show, and if you haven't seen it, please check it out. Um, how is that model different, and, and what, what do cable, because they're the ones who have exploded with original programming. Is there beginning to be a need on the cable side, too, for stuff that really stands out and is loud and speaks, maybe in a different way from the broadcast yeah, networks? You know, I think the, the game isn't really that different. I think what works is different. Clearly, cable uh, can push boundaries uh, of content a little further. Uh, there are so many cable platforms that the cable networks that have uh, been attracted to the most distinct, uh, unique programming, I think, have had the most success. We're very lucky that we've got uh, a sister division in FX run by John Langraff, who's done just such a great job over there. Um, but we really, uh, you know, it's interesting. We try to, you know, fundamentally for both of our businesses, uh, cable and broadcast, we're all about the creators. And one of the things we sell these great writers is you come to our studio, dream your biggest idea. If it's right for broadcast, fantastic. If it's right for cable, we're going to support that. And, and so really what we're always looking for is, uh, you know, specific, unique um, things that are not really on TV. And whether you end up with Sons of Anarchy, um, Homeland, the Americans, Tyrant now with uh, Howard Gordon over at FX, or you end up with uh, things that maybe are just a little bit broader and more mainstream, uh, A Modern Family, uh, you know, obviously Glee, Empire, all those shows, you know, there's room for all of it, but they all start with supporting the vision of great creators and, and trying to allow them to stay with as pure a vision as possible. Right. Um, so you, you, you work with broadcast, you work for, for cable. Um, if you could give some examples, there are advantages to going straight to series, there are advantages and disadvantages to the pilot. I, is there, how, how do you determine if a show falls into one or the other? Yeah, no real formula, unfortunately. That would make it so much easier. <laughs> you know, we try to make a determination based on what's best for each project. Scream Queens, we went straight to series. Ryan Murphy came in. You know, he had a very clear vision for the show. It is an event miniseries model, so it will restart each season with subsequent seasons. He pitched out very, you know, deep specificity about the characters, where the show was going. That made sense. It enabled us to produce the show financially in a more cost-effective way because we were doing a series, we weren't doing a standalone pilot, and then shutting down, and then having to amortize that over the rest of the series. We could, you know, build into the series Amort for this beautiful set that's used right away. So that made great sense, and the pilot process is extremely meaningful to us. You know, I can't tell you the number of times we've looked at a project in pilot stage and the characters that you think are gonna have the most heat or the greatest relationship, mm. the storyline that you think is gonna have the most drive, you watch the pilot and actually it exists in another place. And that's hard to capitalize on when you're going straight to series and the trains have left the station. So no one size fits all. We try to do all forms of development because really we're, we're these are living dynamic projects. It's not so easy as to say there's a formula. Right. Um, a lot of international buyers clamor for procedurals because they're easier to, to, to schedule. You can schedule them in different orders. Is, it, is the age of the procedural over in the United States or is it still, uh, are there still chances for it? Is well, it's, it still? It's definitely not over. You know, I, I don't think anything any type of programming is over. Things tend to go in cycles, and the procedural was so successful in the U.S. for you know, 10, 15 years that it's inevitable there's going to be, um, you know, they're going to get a little tired. Um, and I just think, um, you know, we're, we're looking to have some writer come in with a great procedural idea that's going to create, uh, recreate the genre uh, a little bit. You know, our uh, signature, um, Procedural has been Bones, which is a very sort of character-based, 
light procedural. Which uh, has been on the air for how many years 11 now? seasons yeah. uh, now. And uh, just had a, uh, a premiere that was up from last season, so it's still going strong. Um, so we're very interested in it, um, and we hear about it all the time from buyers who, um, you know, while they love our serialized shows and they admire them, a lot of their audiences are more comfortable with uh, episodic formats. So uh, we're still looking at that. We, we launched one this year, Rosewood, which in right. some ways has a lot of uh, similar DNA to, um, to Bones. You know, two great leads, a male, female, you know, quite a bit of banter, and also um, sort of based in a, a world of science. We asked Ryan Murphy to come up with a procedural for this year. We did. We thought it would be so interesting to see a creator who actually has already done a procedural. He did Nip Talk, right. which I loved. Yes. It was really appointment viewing in my house. So, you know, again, I think our, our best experiences have been when you take a writer like Chris Carter, who I think prior to the X-Files had done mostly comedy, and you put them in a genre where they're not 100% comfortable, but they want to be in that space. So hopefully Ryan will come up with something. Okay, now this question isn't meant to be like, which is your favorite child, but <laughs> are there any shows you have on your slate right now that you're particularly excited about and you would like the international audience to hear all more about shows. those? We're all excited our, about all, our children all of are them. Beautiful. <laughs> you love all your children equally. Yes. You know, I think from the network, um, uh, we're particularly excited about Tuesday night we put three new shows on, which we thought was kind of bold scheduling. It isn't what you do normally, but we really thought we had the goods in Grandfather and Grinder to have an hour that felt cohesive. Um, and behind that, Scream Queens, which we thought would uh, really appeal to women and, and uh, um, create a lot of noise. And you know, the shows have launched. Um, the shows have launched well. Again, we were talking about before the delayed viewing. You know, if you look at the on-demand viewing for those three shows, um, people are finding them, and, and we're confident that uh, the numbers for all three are going to work out quite well. O over at the studio, um, we produce all three of those shows. One we're partnered with um, Disney on, but we also have Life in Pieces at CBS, which uh, I think is following kind of a typical CBS half hour pattern of they put it behind a show like The Big Bang and they just sit with it patiently right. and wait for their comedy audience to discover it. And um, actually this afternoon, uh, I was relaxing for a little bit before coming over here. I watched episode four of Life in Pieces. It's hysterical. And uh, you know, the, the uh, people producing it are doing a great job. Right. Um, I, I, I've been traveling. I can't wait. My DVR is going to explode. I haven't been <laughs> able to watch everything. Um, you, so tonight you're going to be honored as personalities, plural, of the year. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. A partnership like yours is uncommon in the business. How did it come about? How did you first start working together? And can you whatever secrets you can reveal about how it's worked so well for so long. You know that there are so many marriages that they don't last anywhere near how long you've been working together. Well, I would say I'm very lucky because I'm here with my partner of 16 years and my husband of 20. So long partnerships seem to be part of my DNA. You know, we were put together a long time ago, 16 years ago, Peter Chernin was running Fox and Sandy Grusho was running our studio at the time, and Sandy had ambitions of actually doing the same job we're doing, overseeing the studio and the network. And to do that, he needed strong leadership at the studio. There was already a very strong executive at the network. And at that point, my background was exclusively marketing and then the creative area. And Gary had been in the business area and then served for a time with Peter Roth as kind of his number two. So he had a little bit a familiarity with the broader organization. But I think it was Peter's idea to put us together and see if our complementary skills enabled us to cover a lot of ground. And I would say there were growing pains at the beginning. It's not a natural state, a partnership. You know, people are just wired to make quick decisions and to act in an autonomous way. But over time, what we found is, you know, the great benefit of both of our points of view about decision making, about 
running the business, about seeing the future, about you know, managing the personalities in our organization. There was so much benefit to having a partner. And then I would say, you know, over time, probably in the first five or six years, both of us were fluent enough and I think um, able to oversee the entire organization alone. But at that point, it was such a gratifying and fantastic partnership that's enabled both of us to you know, um, cover so much territory, learn so much about the business, hire the best people in, in the industry. You know, when you have one moment and, you know, when there's pressure or stress or tension in an organization and there is one person who you can close the door and sit in a room with alone and strategize, and it can't be your subordinate because that's a different conversation, nor can it be your superior because that's a different conversation. When you're both in it together, great results come out of, of that room. And that's what we've experienced sort of over and over and over again. And Gary is a phenomenal executive, thoughtful, incredibly forward thinking, a great strategic executive. And I would say he balances my maybe more impulsive side, I would say. I'm not gonna say erratic, I'll say impulsive. <laughs> But the two together, again, enable us to sort of have all aspects of, I think, what you would want in, in leaders. Well, Dana said it uh, beautifully, as she always does, but um, you know, the one thing I always say about it is, in a business where there is so much failure, it's really great to have someone to be at your side and shoulder the failure. And when you have a success, there's plenty of credit for everyone to enjoy it. And um, you know, it's, it would be my, given a choice, it would be my preference to do this as a partnership. It's actually just a lot more fun to have someone to share the success with, to, to uh, deal with the challenges. And uh, I've always thought that in any relationship, and my wife of 30 some odd years, 33 years, uh, is, is here uh, as well. Let's see if I got that right. Yes, 33 years. You better years. be careful because yeah, maybe, <laughs> Nope, 34 years, actually. Um, and, uh, and basically, you just have to have a commitment to wanting to make it work. You have to have some goodwill because inevitably, you know, like any people, you're going to do things that, um, you know, make mistakes or you're going to do things that, that frustrate someone else. You just have to be committed to the long-term view of, I want this partnership to work. I like this person. We're better together. And uh, so it's... It, um, it's kind of been easy in a lot of ways for me because I've, I've loved working with Dana. Well, there's no doubt you've benefited from the partnership, but your company certainly has, and we all, as viewers, have from the great shows you've given us. Will you please join me in thanking our fantastic Thank personalities all. of the year?